dog may lessen just not bothering to plan? That's a question for teflologists. When I read this book, it's better to skim or scan. That's a question for teflologists. Can you be a good teacher if you have a Celta, or should you invest in an MA or a Delta? From politics to methodology, we'll discuss them all on Teflology. Hello, I'm Matthew. I'm Rob. And I'm Matt. And welcome back to Teflology, a podcast about teaching English as a foreign language and related matters, presented by three self-certified Teflologists. Tefl News. Okay, so to begin this section, uh, I'd like to ask you both, how much consideration do you put on um, the history of English language teaching in your day-to-day teaching or, or studies or research? Hmm. In my day-to-day teaching, <laughs> probably not very much. Um, mm-hmm. In my research, quite a lot. Uh, so my research is, my, my, I'm, I'm a PhD student for the listeners at home, um, so my, my PhD research uh, does involve the history of language teaching in Japan a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so a little bit, but not in, not in my teaching, I'd mm. say. It's hard to say. I mean, obviously our teaching is informed by a lot of stuff that we've read yeah. and, and yeah. stuff that we've researched and studied. Um, so in some ways, it probably has filtered down. Um, and I'm interested in the history of uh, English language teaching a lot through this podcast, actually. I'm into, I'm into research topics, yeah, right. for it, yeah. which yeah. has helped that. Um, but yeah, I, 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 it would be hard to kind of pinpoint certain things that I'd say that, you know, that's d- directly related to this aspect of, of ELT history. Mm. Right. Do you think having a, a historical understanding is important to, um, for your profession? It depends. Again, I don't think it's necessarily important for your day-to-day or for my day-to-day teaching, but I think mm. it, it helps people to have an understanding of where their field has, has been in the past and where it is now and why those changes have happened, yeah. you know, um, to understand why, why the situation is as it is. I think that's quite useful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Okay, so kind of related to that is today's TEFL news. Um, <laughs> this news is actually about history, so it's not really news. <laughs> That's the opposite of news. <laughs> That's the opposite of news. But the new, the new bit of the news in particular is a newly founded Isla Research Group okay. that was founded in uh, last month, January 2015, mm-hmm. uh, by Rich, Professor Richard Smith at the University of Warwick. Ah. Um, are you familiar with Richard Smith's work? We've actually talked about him before on the podcast a little bit. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Richard Smith and a group of others have formed a new Isla research group. How are you spelling Isla? A I L A. Okay. So, Richard Smith and a group of others have formed a new Isla research group mm-hmm. uh, titled The History of Language Learning and Teaching. Right. Mm. And the aims of the network are to stimulate research into history of language learning and teaching within applied linguistics internationally. Okay. Uh, to help understand historical developments and furnish necessary historical perspectives for professional reflection mm. on how language education is or should be carried out today. Yeah, that kind of similar to what we said. Yeah, <laughs> basically, yeah. So for me, this, this seems like quite an interesting group, and I'd like mm. to kind of find out more about it, because personally, about the, the history of English language teaching is something that I've kind of neglected, I guess, in my own studies and writing it's something mm. that I'm, I'm aware of obviously yeah but i've never mm. actually looked into it more yeah, yeah. I, I mean i think it's when you talk about the history of 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 this um i guess there's different aspects there's the kind of through line of the the theory behind it but there's also the the people behind it right yeah mm. yeah so i guess the extent of my historical knowledge comes from like methodologies mm. right which i guess is one perspective on it yeah, but uh, obviously on this program we talk about TEFL pioneers mm. as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, but this particular research group is yeah kind of interesting for me in that regard. Mm. Um, it also looks into other areas such as the appropriate development of language education policies, yeah. uh, curricular and textbook reform initiatives, mm-hmm. and teaching methodologies for different contexts. So you, this group is uh, it's kind of interdisciplinary, I guess. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So they they hold conferences. There's been a conference held quite recently in July 2014 mm. at the University of Nottingham. Yeah. Um, the title of the conference was Connecting Cultures. Right. And I just had a look at some of the abstracts from the conference, and it seems really interesting. 
Uh, for example, there was a okay, there was a talk given by Professor Giovanni Imatino. I hope I'm saying that right. You're not. <laughs> Matt, Matt, you're better with uh, these. I don't know. These. Yeah, yeah, Martino. That's good. Yeah, that will do. Yeah. <laughs> like that. We did that justice. He gave a presentation um, surveying the period from the si mid 16th century to the Restoration in Britain. Hmm. And he wanted to highlight the connections and tensions between the study of foreign languages and the socio-political, cultural, and ideological development of Britain as a nation. Mm. Yeah. So that seems quite interesting yeah. to come I mean, from that perspective. I think an interesting thing that uh, you find when you do look at the history of VLT is how much it is influenced, or even how much it influences the development of the rest of the world. So like, we spent a long time talking about we spent maybe a few sections talking about the Philippines and English in the Philippines. Mm. And mm. you can't d discuss English in the Philippines without discussing the history and you know all the, all the things that have made the Philippines what it is as a modern state. Mm. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting how, yeah. how entwined they are. Definitely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess my feeling at the moment is I'm just, I'm kind of acting as at the end product. Mm. I haven't really considered the full history, like the diverse history that exists. I, I've just kind of considered what we're doing now in the classroom. But mm. I think it's more important to, to think about where all of this came from. Yeah. yeah. The, something that I've noticed a lot when researching topics for, for this podcast is how a lot of the things or the, the, the theories um, that we think are so kind of new and, and cutting edge, mm. It's, mm. It, it does seem like people throughout history have come up with similar ideas. Yeah, yeah. And there are some maybe some basic commonsensical things about language teaching, which get lost occasionally through, you know, odd methodologies. Yeah. But they're always mm. there. Yeah. It's like um, in the, the a History of English Language <coughs> Teaching mm -hmm. by, what's his face? Um, who, who's Howitt. that? APR Howitt. 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 APR yeah. Howitt, yeah. yeah. Um, in that, like, if you read some of the early chapters, you're kind of going, well, this is task-based learning, <laughs> right. but it's in the 14th century. Exactly, How did yeah. that happen? Yeah. Actually, wasn't um, Richard Smith APR Howitt's doctoral student? I, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I, they work together, and they've recently um, produced an article last year, right. um, kind of updating the issues. Okay. Basically, yeah, which I was reading earlier on. Right. Okay, so for me, this new research network is quite interesting. It's something that I'd like to engage with more and mm -hmm. find out more about. And I think it's certainly important for teachers uh, teaching the English language to consider the history of um, what brought us to this state. Mm, yeah. So that's today's TEFL news, all about history. <laughs> <laughs> Not news at all. TEFL Pioneers. Um, this week's TEFL Pioneer is um, maybe a key figure in the history of mm -hmm. VLT, like, like Matt was just talking about. Mm -hmm. um, his name is Lawrence William Fawcett. Have you heard uh, of him? I have, actually. Okay. I don't know why or where or how <laughs> or when, but I have. Um, okay. I, I, the research I did seems like he's quite the pioneer in, in, in a few different areas of, mm -hmm. of, okay. of TEFL. Um, so he was born 1892 in Quincy, Illinois. Right. Um, he was the elder son of an electrical engineer, and his mother was a devoted Episcopalian. Okay. Um, he moved a lot around the States um, and then ended up in Chattanooga, Tennessee, mm -hmm. where he spent his teenage years and attended the University of Chattanooga. Right. Is there <laughs> such a thing? I just like saying Chattanooga, but yes, it is. A place. <laughs> it sounds like a fun place to live. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> it may well be. Um, he, in 1915, uh, he got his bachelor's degree in divinity okay. from uh, the University of the South in Tennessee. <laughs> yeah, doesn't sound is that, that, prob <laughs> that isn't there anymore, is it, surely? I don't know, but that, that is what that learning establishment was called, the University <laughs> of the South. Um, and the following year, year, he was ordained as an Episcopalian minister. Ah. Yeah. Good um, for him. <laughs> Episcopalians, I don't know if you know, have a have a track record in establishing um, foreign um, learning institutes. I think mm. um, Randall McDonald mm -hmm. was trained at an Episcopalian <coughs> school. May, may well have been. Yeah. yeah. So that's not related to the Thomasites at all. Uh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, my 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 uh, paternal grandmother mm. on that side of my family is Episcopalian. All right. Yeah. They're basically the Church of England in... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so, anyway, he became an Episcopalian minister, um, but he was also given a Rhodes Scholarship at Oxford. Mm -hmm. So he went, went over to Oxford, um, 1917 to 1919. Um, he was unable to begin his studies, though, because um, the USA entered the war right. um, in April of 1917. Uh, Fawcett actually entered the British services 
mm. um, since he was already there. I think he would have had to go back to the States to enlist. Right. And he wanted to enlist, and so he just enlisted in the British Army. Oh, okay. I guess that was something Fair he could enough. do. Yeah. <laughs> um, in 1918, he married an English woman, uh, Mariel Grace, Margaret Barr, mm. to give her her full due. Um, and uh, once the war was over, returned to Oxford to finally begin his studies. Um, there, he, he carried out research in comparative philology. Mm. Um, and at that point, he came into contact with two people, Joseph Wright and William Craigie. Okay. Um, who, William Craigie was um, one of the editors of the Oxford English Dictionary, that oh, they, right. they called the okay, New English right. Dictionary. Yeah. Um, so he got his MA at Oxford. He went back to the University of the South. Was that, was that an MA by payment? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, w- went back to the University of the South in 1921 to become an assistant professor of English. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's just really the beginning of his, his global travels. Okay. So the following year, he went to China um, for the, the, something called the Board of Missions the, for the Protestant Episcopal Church mm-hmm. and became an assistant professor of English at an Episcopalian institution in China, St. John's University in Suzhou, oh. Suzhou, Suzhou, something like that, yeah. Yeah. near Shanghai. Um, and initially, he devoted himself to learning Chinese, the Chinese language, yeah. um, but he soon found himself very intensively involved in writing English teaching materials okay. and very quickly realized that this is what he was very passionate about mm. um, and research into English uh, language teaching. Mm. Um, he became an advocate of uh, direct teaching, basically right, direct, right. what they call direct principles of teaching. Um, and that's how he began teaching English when he was in China. Right. Um, he, his, his interest in, in researching um, language teaching, he followed a lot of different areas. Um, like a lot of other people at the time, he was very interested in um, phonology and pronunciation. Yeah, yeah. Um, he, he thought that it was probably difficult for untrained teachers to use the IPA. Mm. Um, it's difficult for trained teachers <laughs> as well. <laughs> That's true. Um, mm. And so he was uh, an advocate of a system developed by um, Craigie, um, the, the professor at Oxford, of what they call pronunciation marks. Right. I guess it's maybe just a simpler system right. of, of indicating, a, a written way of system of indicating pronunciation. Right. Is that kind of like when uh, you... In the classroom, you just sort of draw an upwards arrow and that kind of thing. Like yeah, uh, I wonder. Very simplified, yeah, basic yeah, stuff. Yeah, underlining or, stress syllables. Yeah, or a dot little above dot, the, yeah. the yeah, syllable, yeah. whatever, yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly, but yeah. Mm. Um, so Craigie had, had developed the system and, and written a lot about phonology. And um, yeah, and so um, Fawcett was very kind of influenced by these things. And he started writing his own materials. Mm. Um, he wrote a book called Practical Pronunciation Helps. Um, um, adaptations of, of Craigie's works as well. By 1925, he'd been in China for a while, um, he decided that um, his main, his main in- area of influence in China mm. was through language teaching, language study and textbook writing. Right. Um, basically, he kind of gave up his missionary activities okay. at that point um, for a couple of reasons. I think, one, he was much more interested in um, writing, writing materials for language learning. Yeah. Also, there was starting, at that time, there was some mistrust against foreign influence in general in China, mm-hmm. and maybe especially against missionaries. Yeah. So he actually resigned from the Episcopalian mission, and then just carried on as a, as a professor. Okay. And that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, it seemed like he, he did gain quite a lot of influence in, in, um, in the government in China, and, right. was, and was able to, to work a lot in, in developing materials. Um, he briefly went back to Chattanooga mm. um, and then took up residence in Chicago where he met up with um, Sir Craigie again. Um, and Craigie supported Fawcett's PhD at um, the University of Chicago. Right. On, his dissertation was on the revision of scientific language principles for oriental application in the teaching uh-huh. of English. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, and he wrote quite a few books um, with this term, oriental application. Mm. Um, I, what I'm not sure about is is how exactly, uh, on on what principles he decided that his materials were aimed at East Asian students necessarily. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it's probably best not to speculate. <laughs> it's probably best not to go too too far into it. Yeah. Um, so um, he actually returned to China to Yanqing University. But he was an associate professor there mm. um, from tw- 1927 to 1930. Um, he trained. Um, 
English teachers. He did he he coordinated a study of typical errors by the staff of the English department. Oh right, that's interesting. Yeah, that's uh, kind of yeah, yeah. I mean, you get books full of that now. But mm. I wonder if that was the first time that was done. Mm. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah. Um, and he also started just teaching classes in, in a small village near the university mm. um, and re- related back to this idea of this direct method. He taught only in English. He didn't use any Chinese at all okay. in his classes. How, how good did he get at Chinese? Because you said he devoted himself to study. Mm. That how, how good did he get at, Like, Was this a choice of necessity? or? <laughs> I don't think so. It seemed like he, he really did believe in the, in the direct method. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, um, at that time, he also prepared a series of readers called the Step-by-Step Readers mm-hmm. um, with the doctor, Fong Sek. Um, and he then um, became kind of linked to Japan. Right. So he, um, uh, I think, somehow got relations with a, with a professor Palmer in Tokyo. Mm-hmm. And oh, Harold Palmer? I think it was Harold Palmer, actually. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Um, back references. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, back yeah. references. <laughs> he then uh, moved with his family to Japan. I think he had two, two daughters at this point, mm-hmm. and did an exchanged post with a Professor Martin, J.B. Martin, who was associate professor at Aoyama Gakuin, okay. the university mm. that we know yeah, here in Tokyo. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and, and, and started working there. He published a lot through something called the Institute for the Research of English Teaching. Started, started by Harold Palmer. We talked about this. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, so so Fawcett was heavily involved in that. Oh, nice. um, again, he was teaching um, class beginning classes, all English, using no Japanese at all. Mm. Um, and yeah, at at this point, um, he started becoming more interested in vocabulary. Right. Um, and that kind of became much of the focus of of a lot of his work from then on. Um, Basically, he, I, I'm not sure by what methods, but he established um, high-frequency, low-frequency words. Oh, okay. And to, to make these readers, these graded readers, mm. um, he basically he, he chose, he, he grouped words by their frequency. Mm. Right. Um, and so had, yeah, just as, as, you can, as a grader reader does, high-frequency words for the lower levels and gradually adding more vocabulary. Mm. Um, so he, he was one of the first to do that. Um, there was a, a nice quote by Harold Palmer about mm. um, Fawcett. Um, th- th- there's a lot written about all this research he did and his work with phonology and vocabulary. Yeah. Um, but there's also a lot just talking about his his skills as a as a classroom teacher mm. um, and his very kind of humanistic qualities as a classroom teacher. Right. Um, Harold Palmer's quote was. Um, with Dr. Fawcett's methods, it is impossible to conceive of any student, good, bad, or indifferent, being neglected. And what is more, provides every student with the right kind of opportunity that suits his peculiar needs. Here, surely, is an ideal for every language teacher. Dr. Fawcett, by his lecture, issued a challenge, and like a good sermon, left his audience asking, what can we do about it? Mm. Okay, um, to be honest, we're, we're, we're kind of at the midway point here about uh, Fawcett, and there's mm-hmm. still quite a lot to say about him and his pioneering work. Um, so what we'll do, maybe a first for Tephology. Um, we'll stop there. We'll, we'll call that the end of part one mm-hmm. of um, Fawcett and continue next time. Tefl Cultures. So far, the podcast has been quite historical. Uh, mm-hmm. This episode has been quite historical. And now I'm going to go all conceptual on your asses. <laughs> okay. Historically conceptual. No, just generally. Oh, okay. So um, this is an explicit mark. <laughs> yeah, good. Okay. Um, so this uh, section is going to be talking about the native speaker concept, the concept of the native speaker. Um, this is quite a contentious term. It's quite a disputed term. Yeah. Uh, and I'd like to talk about why that is. Okay. Um, because surely it's common sense what a native speaker is, who is uh-huh. a native speaker, who isn't. Yeah. Um, what would be your, uh, your definition? Um, if someone to ask, were to ask you, uh, what a native speaker was, what would you say? Yeah, so, f- so first I'd go to somebody from America, somebody from Canada, somebody mm. who speaks English as a first language okay. by their parents. But it doesn't have to be in just those countries, but mm. first language, I, I guess. Okay. Yeah, I, w- I would say the same. Somebody who has English as a mother tongue. Right. Yeah. Okay. Their mother tongue, yeah. Interesting. R- regardless of, of, of where they're from or where they live. Right, so, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, actually, there are two ways of approaching the concept of the native speaker. Mm-hmm. Um, so first, 
uh, from a theoretical linguistics viewpoint mm -hmm. and then from an applied linguistics viewpoint. Mm -hmm. So theoretically, in theoretical linguistics, um, the native speaker is seen as a kind of an idealized figure a reference point that you can hang larger concepts, larger structures and frameworks and things on, yeah. uh, someone you can test hypotheses on. Yeah. Um, so Chomsky in 1965 in Aspects of the Theory of Syntax, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, of uh, he says that the object of linguistic study is an ideal speaker-listener in a completely homogenous speech community who knows its language perfectly and is unaffected by such grammatically irrelevant conditions as memory limitations, distractions, shifts of attention and interest, and errors, random or characteristic, in applying his knowledge of the language in actual performance. Okay? Okay. So that is obviously not a real person. <laughs> yeah. Right? It's a deliberate abstraction. It's, it's simplified in, in the way any science is. It's, it's a simplified model that you can use to test things on. Yeah. Um, so that's the way that the native speaker is seen in theoretical linguistics. Um, now, obviously, applied linguistics is a practical field. Mm -hmm. um, we have to maybe think carefully before importing that kind of definition directly into applied linguistics. Mm. Uh, so perhaps the most well-known or uh, the most widely accepted definition of the language speaker in applied linguistics is in the Longman Dictionary of Language Teaching and Applied Linguistics. Uh, and there they say that a, na a native speaker has five particular attributes. So number one, learns the language as a child. Mm -hmm. Number two, continues mm -hmm. to use it fluently as a dominant language. Mm -hmm. Number three, uses the language grammatically fluently and appropriately. Mm -hmm. Number four, identifies with a community in which the language is spoken. Mm -hmm. And number five, has clear intuitions about grammatical correctness. Mm -hmm. I I have issues with a few of those. Okay, yeah. which one is in particular? <laughs> um, can yeah, I have a look. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'd say um, continues to use it fluently as a dominant language. Mm. I think you could you know grow up um, by like native bilingual. Yeah. And maybe one of the one of your native languages. Mm. Um, you don't use it as a dominant language, but it's still there. Right. Um, so I don't think it has to be your dominant language. Okay. Um, I also think, let's see, da, 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 identifies with the community in which the language is spoken. I mean, I guess it depends how we define community. Mm. Um, and which community? Sure. Yeah. yeah is yeah. it inner circle communities? Or yeah. Right. Or what, what well, I, it just says a, a community in which the language is spoken. So maybe, mm. maybe I, I'd, I'd be okay with that if, if, if the definition of community in this is, is flexible enough to include um, things like um, children of, of uh, you know, English parents living in, a, in another country right, they right, form right. a kind of community. Okay. Yeah. Now, what I would like to ask is, we've got this first uh, attribute, learns the language uh, right. as a child. Actually, my, my one other point was, I, the, I wouldn't use the, term, the word learns. I'd say oh. acquires. Okay, fine. Well, e no. either way, acquires language as a child, learns language as a child. Yeah. Let's say we cover that up. Yeah. Can you uh, imagine or can you think of, can you recall, yeah. a second language speaker who uses English as a dominant language? Mm-hmm. Yeah? Yeah. How about a second language speaker who uses the language grammatically, fluently, and appropriately? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, a second language speaker who identifies with a community in which the language is spoken? To an extent. Yeah. yeah. Um, and a, a second language speaker who has clear intuitions about grammatical correctness? Yeah. yeah. So this yeah. definition mm. has nothing to do, really, with mm. actual language proficiency. So it comes down to more about where someone's born. It's, it's, right. it's just this first point, learns the language as a child. Yeah which defines what a native speaker is, in which case yeah, the yeah. definition might as well be learns the language as a child. Sure, sure. Yeah. 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 Now, I think that's a bit which, of a problem. Which is, the, which is the one that we started with. Sure, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. But I think that's a bit of a problem because people do uh, use the, the term native speaker and non-native speaker to refer to proficiency mm -hmm. uh, yeah. in a kind of roundabout way. Yeah. Um, so this definition, I think, is actually not very helpful, but this is the most widely used one. Mm. Um, my second question would be, do you think that someone who uh, someone could move between these two categories, even if this did represent what a native speaker is, mm. if we exclude that first point, mm -hmm. is it possible for someone who is a second language speaker to become mm. as fluent? Yeah. Yeah, I, yes. yeah, I think so, of course. Yeah. 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 That's what our job is, isn't it? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to make people into... Well, well I think, I think we have realistic arguably. goals, but, <laughs> but, but you know, certainly yeah. I, I've met people who have learned English as, as a foreign those. language and achieved all of those things. But isn't there yeah. a problem with that? Because we're saying that they're achieving these native mm -hmm. speaker ideals. Isn't there a problem with 
with that in itself? What, what, sure, yeah. what are those ideas? Well, well, this is, I mean, that is a problem, but again, this is a problem as identified by this definition. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Alan Davies, not the comedian, not the, not the Liverpool baiting comedian, mm-hmm. um, he, uh, <laughs> he says that it is possible to, for people to move between the two categories. Um, Enric Yerda and uh, another person <laughs> whose name I forgot to write down, uh, in one of their articles they said that it's entirely possible for a second language learner to master the intuition, grammar, spontaneity, creativity, pragmatic control, and interpreting quality of born, in inverted commas, mm. native speakers. Yeah. Um, so this seems to me not to be a useful definition, but this is the one that people would most likely right. understand. To me, the, the problem there is, is with the word native. Mm. Um, it's just, it's just they've chosen a, the wrong word. So what word would you use? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, na- native implies, you know, from birth. Mm. Basically, yes, right. yeah. Um, yeah. So it's for me that that would be the term just to imply somebody who, is, you know, has English or whatever language as a mother tongue, right? Um, yeah. Which which would which would only satisfy that first um, mm. category, yeah. Um, whereas I don't, I'm, what I'd prefer is another term to describe people who've reached that level, which mm. again is may, maybe hard to define. Yeah. Well, um, mate, I'll I'll come back to that in a minute because I do have something to say about that. Mm. Um, but first, I, I want to speak a little bit about another problem mm. with this way of identifying the native speaker. As I said, the problem with this definition, it's not so much a problem in terms of the theory, in terms of theoretical linguistics, but when you apply it, when mm-hmm. you're actually using it to put people in categories, mm-hmm. it does have problems for, yeah. for teachers and for students and for people trying to live in different countries and so on. Yeah. Um, so an argument that Davies makes, that other people make, is that the native speaker, this idea of the native speaker, is actually a social construct. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's based more around a range of social, cultural, and political influences. Um, so, for example, you were saying, what standard are we talking about? Mm. Um, so there are some studies that I've read where people who were raised in countries uh, like in Africa and Asia, where they spoke English as one of their first languages, as mm. you were saying, um, they're actually put into ESL programs in American universities. Mm. Are they not native speakers? Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, also, uh, a study by Brooke Griffler and Samimi, 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 I don't know, um, said that uh, people were assigned by their peers native or non-native speaker status on the basis of accent, mm-hmm. nationality, mm. assertiveness, mm-hmm. like how willing are they to to identify as a native speaker. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, there are all of these different things that combine to influence our opinion of what is a native speaker and, or who is or what, who is a native speaker and who isn't a native speaker. Mm. Um, and, yeah, I mean, this is, uh, I think, a problem in a practical applied field mm-hmm. where you're, you're not talking about abstracts, you're talking about real people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. This, this problem kind of manifests itself in job applications mm. or job postings where they ask for a native speaker. Yeah. Because they can't say, they can't say we want a British person. They can't say they want a white person, for yeah. example. So I think, do you think that their workaround is native yeah. speaker? I, I'm not sure. Right. And why are we more, if we are native speakers, yeah. why do they assume we're more communicative? Why do they assume we can do these? Well, exactly. I mean, there's a whole raft of other problems that yeah, come yeah. from using the native speaker right, right. label. Yeah. There's a whole raft of other the, assumptions that come along. Right. I mean, basically, what it comes down to is the the native speaker label is there because presumably people who don't know enough about language acquisition, second language mm. acquisition, yeah. assume that somebody who is a native speaker would be better at teaching than somebody, than somebody sure, who sure. has learnt English. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then I think again, for me, the problem is using the term native. Yeah. Um, or using that word. Mm. Um, whereas when I was young, I mean, before I knew anything about languages at all, the, the word fluent to me mm. always meant somebody who who used a language at, at what I imagined was a native-like level. Right, right. But it didn't necessarily mean native. It didn't mm. necessarily mean that was their first language. Yeah. So I have in my family people who have acquired English as a second language to mm. um, I, I, one particular uncle who people can't tell that, that, that it's not his first language. Right. That, that's the level he's reached. Mm. And I would say he's fluent in English. He's, yeah. he's not a native English speaker, but he's a fluent English speaker. Right, right, right. Um, and I think, but, and, but fluent could also be somebody who maybe the pronunciation marks them not as a native speaker. Sure. But still, mm. yeah. you know, at, at a certain level, 
Yeah, so I, I think this is um, where people have tried to go a little bit with, uh, in terms of theory about you know, speakerhood and so on. Mm. Um, I think it was Rampton in 1990 said that uh, instead we should call them expert speakers, mm -hmm. people who've reached right. a very high level. So basically, instead of talking about something yeah. inborn, it's yeah, about yeah. a level of proficiency. Mm. So I think the, the, the issue there that is that um, employers mm. would see that and say, well, how do I know you're really an expert? Right, right, right. And they say, I, I want you to be a native speaker. I mean, they're, yeah. they're wrong, but that's, mm. that's how they would feel about sure. it, maybe. Uh, but then against what are we measuring this term expert? Yeah. Right. Uh, so, I mean... Can they do the job? Well, <laughs> that's, sure. that's what it should come down to. Well, if we're talking about employment, but if we're talking yeah. about other things, right. just right. in terms of people fitting in with the community or whatever, then yeah. that, you know, it's, it's different concerns. Well, um, I mean, and the community thing is, it's, I think that, that comes down to more mm. attitude than anything. People can mm. very well fit into communities without being, you know, being relatively low-level speaking yeah, that yeah, language. Yeah. Sure. Well, as, as um, again, Alan Davies says, um, individuals regard themselves and others as native speakers for symbolic rather than communicative purposes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, so I think that's a big part of it. I think perhaps one way around this problem of which standards are we using to define this is um, English as a lingua franca. Mm. So defining ability to communicate or using ability to communicate as the thing against which we're defining, uh, defining proficiency. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so... To conclude, uh, is the native speaker a myth? That's what Alan Davies says. I don't think so. Um, intuitively, I don't feel like they're like this is a myth. Mm. But uh, I don't think that they're very useful labels in applied linguistics. So when in conferences, people often say a native speaker, whatever that is, and I say that a lot as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't really think that these things don't exist. I'm definitely a non-native speaker of Japanese. My students are definitely non-native speakers of English at the moment. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's possible to move between those two levels. I don't know if they're useful labels. I, well, in fact, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying they're not. They're not useful labels in applied linguistics because they're not value-free descriptions. They're heavily influenced yeah. by politics, by society, by culture, mm -hmm. um, and they have the potential to do real harm to people in professional situations and in terms of self-identity. So you're saying there needs to be a, a kind of maybe a new or a new measurement for language ability. Um, well, I, as I just, yeah, as I just yeah. suggested, perhaps something more along the lines of English as a lingua franca. Yeah. But it's a very difficult thing to try and work around. Yeah, I mean, you often see the terms, for example, in research, they talk about interactions between native and non-native. Mm. And we kind of know what that means. Yes. Yeah. Um, but there, there's obviously a lot of grey area there as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But we, I... I feel like we do need some kind of label to identify that kind of interaction. Sure, and it's just, it's just where do we draw the label? Do we need one label or do we need lots of different situation-specific labels? Right, but we, yeah. we don't want to make it too confusing either. Right, right. <laughs> but it's, I mean, it's very difficult. It's any kind of continuum, where do you draw the lines? Yeah. You know? yeah. um, it's, it's a very difficult thing to say, and I don't think it, there is a simple answer necessarily. Mm. Um, but I think it is uh, important to be aware that these labels that people commonly use they're not value-free. They are potentially harmful yeah. in the way that they're applied. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's today's Cephal culture. <laughs> um, we could continue this. Well. <laughs> yeah. 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 well, anyway, that's enough for now yeah. on the concept <laughs> of the native speaker. Thank you very much for listening to this episode. Uh, if you'd like to get in contact with us, please send an email to tefalology at gmail.com or you can follow us on Twitter at tefalology. So it's goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Goodbye. stands for uh, <laughs> what does it stand for I don't I don't know it's just Isla that's okay. what it stands for is it <laughs> you know every time you say that it goes at the end of the podcast <laughs> <laughs> nice. are you familiar with any Isla groups or this particular group no no, no. I don't even know what Isla stands for <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> uh, let's see We'll edit that out. <laughs> I guess we will. Don't say that, because... <laughs>